Next time she's here or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Seconds? Okay, great. Hello there, you're welcome along to the uh, Sunday Papers. We're coming to you in podcast form and also we are streaming live on Facebook. Thanks very much for joining us. Have in studio Mick Foley from the Sunday Times and Kieran Cunningham from the Irish Daily Star. I'll get to your headlines first of all. So there's uh, plenty of Dublin on the back pages. Sunday Times Sport first of all. We have semi-detached, which maybe sums up how some people felt as the second half uh, transpired just in Crow Park. Dublin 124, Galway 212. Gavin Hale's men in the shadows, the uh, strength of Dublin squad is what Jim Gavin was talking about afterwards. And then on the right-hand side here, uh, just an interesting uh, short story, Duncan Castle's Chelsea. They bid hundred million for Jan Oblak, the um, Athletic keeper. They hit his 100 million euro release clause, but the 25-year-old decided to stay. That's an exclusive there in the uh, Sunday Times. Next, we have the Observer. Premier League started yesterday. Lift off, a winning start for Sarri as Pedro wraps up Chelsea victory at uh, Huddersfield. And then uh, they say an exclusive in the Observer. United's plan for director of football could deepen Mourinho's transfer ire. That's uh, inside the Observer today. Sunday Independent then, going with Dublin as well. Jack McCaffrey, who was brilliant yesterday, number one. McCaffrey stars as history beckons for Gavin's brilliant dubs. And then beneath that, uh, Guardiola, not special, but plans to build on winning culture. That's Jamie Jackson. Manchester City getting their campaign underway this afternoon. Mail on Sunday then. Nothing can stop the dubs. And that kind of is the feeling at the moment, isn't it? Galway give their best, but it's not enough against awesome champs. And then uh, Mark O'Shea exclusive, which we'll come to. He's obviously their columnist. Uh, Fitzmaurice didn't need cheap shots from the likes of Pat Spillane. Kind of sums up his column. Next to The Sun, uh, Jose in the Poghouse. This is pretty interesting. These comments came on Friday. I don't know where they were around yesterday. Maybe they just uh, made it to the Sunday papers or maybe they're just being uh, teased out a bit more this afternoon. But they're saying here, Paul Pogba blew his rift with Jose Mourinho wide open again. Essentially, he was asked about his happiness at Old Trafford and with Mourinho and his reply was there are things I cannot say otherwise I will get fined and then went on to talk about how brilliant the likes of Michael Carrick and Kieran McKenna and the coaches are but not Jose Mourinho and then Star Sunday similar theme it's Paul Quiet Pogba fears fine for any more talk more being Mourinho again that quote there are things I can say and there are things I cannot say otherwise I'll get fined so um, again Pogba as he so often does is on plenty of back pages and uh, world-class boss potch so proud of the likes of Kane and Deli Ali back from World Cup and then uh, finally Sunday World Jacks to the fore Gavin's men see off tribe to ge- keep quadruple dream alive and uh, so they're one game away from emula- emulating uh, Mick O'Dwyer's 78 to 81 Kerry Immortals uh, Roy C- Curtis says here so they are your uh, back pages we might start lads with the football yesterday I know you were both in at it Make a few headlines neatly summed it up. The opening to your line summed it up as well. Another day in Crow Park yielded one more tarrow, tarrowing win for Dublin and offered no reduction to the sense that this year's All-Ireland title has sat firmly in their laps since the start of May. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for reminding me. I actually <laughs> forgot. <laughs> when you're in the middle, as Kieran knows, you're in the middle of all that stuff, you kind of have only have a half an idea what you're after writing yourself. Um, yeah, it was... Look, it was what it was, you know. I mean, I don't think there was any there was any great quibbles over the result. It was interesting, actually, if you just listen to people on the radio this morning and a bit last night, like, that, you know, there was this idea that Dublin weren't, you know, they weren't at their best and yet they cruised away. I thought they were... I thought, in, in their own way, they were fairly awesome. Mm. Like, they don't... They don't play the way they used to three or four years ago, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, they don't blow lads away. Mm. Malachi Clerken was making yeah, this point various really times yesterday. yesterday. And yeah. it really resonated after yesterday. The notion that, you know, pre-Donegal 2014, they just blow you away. Whereas now, they're like surgeons. They just, they just prize you apart and they kind of very, very slowly, very gradually just wear you down. They did it in Oma. They did it, they did it yesterday. You know, they, they, it's almost... I'd say it must have been very demoralising for Galway because, like... Galway came, we expected Galway to be very, def- you know, to play defensively and for their system to really test Dublin. Yeah. But 
Dublin basically did to Galway what Galway wanted to do to Dublin. Yeah. They found way, I haven't seen a team all year find as much space in that Galway defence as Dublin did yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Whereas on the other side, Galway were doing, Galway were being forced to do exactly what they would have wanted to force Dublin to do, which was kick from the flanks, um, kind of get bottled up going down the middle, one high ball into Damien Comer, five minutes of a bit of a speed wobble, but that was about the height of it. Yeah, but yeah. There's, like, there's a few things, Joe, that jumped out at me, just in the paper coverage of yeah. it. Like, jo- Joe has a few stats, you know, the, 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 your handed out stats. Is Joe now that it. famous that he doesn't even have a second uh, Joe. name? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brawley, uh, don't give him that. QC. Just don't, don't give him that. Jo- Joseph Brawley QC says, by half time they posted 1 9 from 12 shots. Second half, 15 points from 19 shots. The first seven attacks brought seven points. In the history of Gaelic football, I don't think there's been a team like that. Like Mick wrote a great book about the last, you know, how the last great Kerry team came to came a crop of when they're going for the five in a row, and even ke- that Kerry team. Like I'm young enough to watch those games. They still miss lots, you know. They still made mistakes. They're so clear. Like genu- genuinely, this year I thought there will come a time they'll miss Dermot McConley and we'll be saying they need Dermot McConley. And if they came up against Mayo of 2016, 2017, that might have been the case. But what's there now, they don't miss him at all. Yeah. And like, there's even, there's a few things that, uh, just like Alan Brogan's headline, no, the headline Alan Brogan's piece, Gavin's men are not slaughtering teams but know exactly what they're doing. Uh, they won by nine points and there was a goal right at the end, it would have been 12 only for that. And in a way, we're looking at that as a kind of a tight enough battle for them. And that yeah. nine point in any man's language is a hammering. I think the ultimate line in Brogan's piece, actually, it's where is it here somewhere? He basically says that Dublin supporters would have liked to see the penalty go in. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, get yeah. it. You know, you're in a bad situation, like when, when your own fans want the penalty to go in just so our crowd will get a test, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's true. That's pretty bad. When Galway yeah. won a penalty, I think many Dublin supporters would have liked to see the tribesmen rattle the back of the net and score a second goal. Yeah. I share that view, says Brogan. We haven't seen Dublin under severe pressure this summer and if nothing else if nothing else sure it would have been interesting to see how they'd react sure, sure, sure you would have passed <laughs> the this afternoon for us like, give us another you know, for the crack. this is the yeah. semi-final yeah. it would have been something to chat about up to half time yeah. God, but, but the other thing to be fair though I think we all had the same thought didn't we yeah absolutely I think, uh, oh, yeah. because you want to like like there's going to be a lot of, and we might come to this in a minute, the crowd, like why the crowd was down sure. so significantly. And some people are saying, I think partly the reason might be a lot of Dublin's games aren't competitive and people are turned off by them. They've simply come, become, they've reached a level that other teams yeah. can't reach. They're winning so comfortably. But the, 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 just to focus on individuals, yeah. Jack McCaffrey yesterday, there was a few things about Jack, like his performance was out of this world. Mm. Like there was the exuberance and the pace, and you know, but the anticipation defence and driving forward, some of the balls he put forward. But there was a few other things. When he came off, when he was substitutes three minutes ago, he had this big smile on his face. When he was interviewed afterwards out in the, uh, on RT, one of the first words he used was fun, how much fun he'd had. And he said, we're in a good place. Like, was this? Yeah. And he had a big smile. And he brought you back, remember his... Sunday uh, game. Yeah, the banquet. And yeah. he'd done his cruise shit that day, four minutes into that game. And he was, you know, he was the life and soul of the party. But a lot of people don't realise... That all learned him finally was a couple of weeks into his final year as a medical student in UCD. He qualified as a doctor in June. Can you imagine the pressure of a final year medical while you're trying to rehab a cruciate, which is notoriously difficult to do, and then to reach that level of performance? Mm. That's one individual. Mm. What he's put him through, himself through in the last year, it's remarkable. He's, ex- he's extraordinary. I think he just has a great sense of perspective on the whole thing. Yeah. I think he sees life as a bit of a game, actually. Yeah. 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 As you get to know him. Bit, but you kind of get this all the time. I mean, you know, these teams that win multiple All Irelands and that people only see that's the most visible part of the iceberg, like is the four All Ireland medals or whatever. But the amount of stuff that these guys have gone through, or even in their own careers, kind of different challenges they would have had. Like, but you know, it's not all just about rocking up and winning, you know, knocking the ball around. Winning all yeah. But like McCaffrey, there's just such a joy about the way he plays. There, there was is, a moment yeah. there yesterday where he was just he, he took off from a standing start with the ball in hand, he just blew past the fella. Yeah. And he just made you smile. It was like a child about eight years of age deciding, I'm going to run really fast now for five yeah. seconds and see how far I can go. And to Off see that went. after a cruciate, like, like yeah. and for Donegal, so I'm looking at that, like what's happened, Patrick, Patrick McBurty, mm. and thinking, okay, Patrick might get his pace back exactly where he was. But McCaffrey doesn't seem to have lost anything. Oh, seemed to. Just I thought immaculate. Dennis Walsh had a really class summation of just the, the, the situation. He just yeah. said at one point, it's hard to know anymore how good Dublin are. Yeah. Yeah. In most of their games, the only contest is against themselves and the empirical standards against which they measure their performances. They looked good, but who knows what will be said in the review meeting when they convene in their bunker in DCU. There might be blood in the walls. Yeah, yeah. It is hard when you're watching to actually put yesterday's performance into any kind of context now. 
Yeah. He's, it, the like, t- was it better than the Mayo games? The, yeah. the problem, I suppose, one of the ish things that have, that's happened this year, it's not so much the teams that have gone back, but the teams that are coming at them now are at a different stage of development. Yeah. We'll say to Mayo last year, for example. So Galway have come forward, but they're still a bit back. Tyrone yeah. have come yeah, forward. Yeah, like Mayo was six years back. behind the pro- yeah. gradual progression like, last I, year. I yeah. am fully of the belief, and I have been for a couple of years now, that if you want to beat Dublin, if you're Tyrone or if you're whoever, right, you have to, actually have to go back to the Kerry awfully kind of template if you like and that is you focus your entire year on one game and that's Dublin is that what I mean you for yeah you focus your league you focus your provincial championship you focus all your training you focus the kind of personnel you're developing and you say to yourself well if I can develop a team that can beat Dublin we should be able to beat most everybody else we mightn't do it with all, all the aplomb that we might have done before but we're going to treat this as we're going for Dublin. I want to throw yeah, a few and you see that truth on it, just yeah. very quickly, yeah, because yeah. the only defeat was against Donegal in 2014. And mm. in Rory Cavanagh's book in particular, I think, he points out that Jim McGuinness had been working on that plan for two years on how to beat them. And even when you go back to that game, though, 25 minutes in, Dublin were 8-3 ahead and mm. Connolly had a great goal chance. There would have been eight up and the game was over, yeah. despite all the planning. Yeah. So but you have to take the gamble. how hard it is to beat them. You have to take the gamble at this stage. To remind you of another quote from your uh, piece oh, yesterday, yeah. yeah. Well, so um, this, yeah. it's interesting to talk about where Galway were, because I want to get your thoughts on yeah, yeah. what Galway threw up yesterday, what they produced. Uh, Kevin Walsh said that um, they're very much in a learning curve. He said, playing in headquarters with the red carpet under your feet when you're not used to the little things that go through your head. You have to get used to Crow Park. Maybe the goalposts are moving a small bit. That's probably why we had double the amount of uh, wides and drop shorts that Dublin had mm. and like Joe Brawley's um, sense is come back Mayo all is forgiven and he's yeah. like you know oh look this has been a theme of his all year but he says somebody forgot to tell Galway there was a semi-final on Sean Kavanagh said in RT Radio beforehand that he totally believed Galway will put it up to them like that was going to happen says Joe Al sugary nonsense is his uh, verdict <laughs> on uh, Kavanagh um, and he said uh, I thought uh, or sorry nothing begets nothing he says of Galway's performance I thought of the difference had it been Mayo playing yesterday and not this dull robotic outfit. Is that harsh in Galway, too harsh in Galway, or is there a nub of a fair point there? There's context in all of these things. Like, I mean, Mayo had a good few runs at Dublin over that period of time, so they mm. figured out what works. And one of the things that works with Dublin, and that they got it really right in the last couple of finals, was they got up in their grill when Dublin came forward in a way that Galway didn't yesterday. Galway were kind of a bit more, you know, hold our shape, shuffle back, shuffle across, which they've been doing all year. Mm. Got Mayo, because of their tackling technique, because of the years of seasoning behind them, yeah. because of the pace they played the game at, after years of playing at that level, were able to go out and disrupt uh, Dublin offence when Dublin came forward, you know? Yeah. Galway, Galway are in a situation, Galway have made huge progress this year, like, yeah, yeah. but they're, they came up against... Do you know what it reminded me of? I, <laughs> I was thinking about it this morning. It reminded me, kind of trying to figure out what were Galway like, of going to matches years ago, you know, which which your old fella, right? And you're driving home. We would drive, we'd, we'd drive home the car, and you'd be kind of... You, you, you could be 40 minutes, 50 minutes, mm. analysing what the hell went happened there? Why did they win? Why did they lose? And at the end of the day, he often used to say to me, do you know what? They just weren't able. And... <laughs> That's the end of it. And like yeah. that's the thing with Galway yesterday. They just weren't able, mentally, physically, yeah. tactically, everything. And it's not that they won't be able next year. Yeah. It's just that right now, they came up against a crowd that are so far ahead in terms of time, in terms of experience, in terms of everything. Yeah. And Galway will be better for it. Like, you mentioned, see now how they go at it next year. I'd say they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll pull back a bit on the league, I'd say, and they'll just, again, like I was saying, they'll probably focus on on how, how, how do we handle the Dublin. Dublin. Yeah. Because I, I thought uh, afterwards Kevin Walsh did say something re- uh, which was particularly interesting for post-match press conference, far more interesting than what you normally get. Right. And then he talked about, like, they were promoted last year. Like, this was the, the year back in Division 1. They got to the final unbeaten and then you know, ran Dublin fairly close on that, then won Connacht and beat three Division 1 teams in the Championship. So they had so many big games this mm. year they had to yeah. get up for, and it was just basically, I think it was a bridge too far. Yeah. And the tiredness, the team mental that tiredness. Quality, even the mental, and even the week-on-week week thing. Like yeah. Coming back from Monaghan, like people had their different theories about their attitude again, in that game in Salt Hill. But no matter what their attitude was, they had a week to get ready then for yeah. Dublin. And it's yeah. just, it was just too much. It's not enough. And it's funny know. because there was two announced changes to the Dublin team before the game. John Small and Owen Merchant uh, starting. And they were for man-marking jobs on Shane Walsh and Ian Burke. Mm-hmm. And Walsh and Burke had the, probably had the better they, of the t- they, two battles. They did fine. Enough, they did fine, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The goal we can't take a lot out of this year, but they have to build on it, you know, and they have to tweak their plan. They they do need to to get the ba- change the balance between yeah. defence and attack. You know the like to, 
But that's on the, the surface that's you can say they put up well, two like. twelve, but the game the goal at the end was, you know, it was it was in dead time. Yeah. But like Andy Moran said a few months ago, uh, that you need to score at least twenty points in a big game in Crow Park to beat Dublin. Yesterday you would have needed to score. What would you need to score? 28, well, 29? 24, 28. Yeah, yeah. so like, that's the challenge. But I mean, so. I suppose the flip there is that if Galway had been able to impose more pressure, they wouldn't have got to the 124. Yeah, yeah. But the, the point, but the point remains the, the same. They'll always get to the 20 points. They will, yeah. The yeah, Dublin will always get around 20 points. So they get to the that's 20. a massive challenge for any team to hit that against. But I mean, the kind of pining for Mayo thing comes back to that point that just, we'd say Galway now are, are, are the coming team. like And <laughs> the word, you know, they're a coming team. They're, they're emerging. And Tyrone are emerging. And we just have to... It's going to balance out again in time, like, you know. Yeah. I mean, we are in a sort of a Kerry 78, 81 situation. Yeah. I think Tony Gall are as well. When Tony Gall did the likes of oh, yeah. Mick or McHugh, etc., like they will. And, and Kerry, uh, no, yeah. for all the doom and gloom, if they get, particularly if they get Tony Buckley and his coach and a decent manager, the Kerry have a huge amount of raw material yeah. to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well let's, talk, uh, let's talk Kerry, because there's a few pieces on Kerry. And just by the way, if you're wondering what Jim Gavin was saying, Shane McGrath has his quotes in the mail here. And it's um, the usual stuff, really. He's talking about how great it is to work with such a group of determined men. Makes it so easy. We're on their coattails, he says. They drive the agenda. Motivation comes from them. Selfless with their time and their energy. And they've great support from family and work colleagues. And we're just helping to be the best they can be. And, just uh, just a quick one. What the, did you make of the crowd the the um, before we move on? Like, there's so much talk. Like, it, was a, it was the smallest crowd for Dublin semi finals since 95. Yes. It was just over 54,000. Yeah. Every other semi-final under Jim Gavin, there was at least 80,000. The crowd was virtually identical to the Clare Galway hurling semi-final, which at the same time, 5 p.m. on a Saturday. Yeah. Is there a bit of apathy creeping in? Like There, there are very re various reasons you could put, put forward. It is a peak holiday time. Yeah. Like it's a builder's holiday, yeah. for, for example. It's coming up to people back to school time. A lot of people take their holidays around now. Also, there's a cost factor. And there's there are extra games on the God, we have an All Ireland final next week. Yeah, but is there? A, I wonder is it because I remember the last. I think it was the last All Ireland Ke Kilkenny won when they were doing the lap of honour at the end. A lot of their fans had left before the lap of honour was finished. Yeah. Like, is there a sense of being taken for granted in any way? Do you think? I, I think all the things you hit on are yeah, yeah, perfectly fair and legitimate, and can account for about fifteen, twenty thousand people not showing up for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's different. I mean, yeah. you think of Cluxton and that free against Kerry and yeah, the euphoria. Yeah, absolutely. With each passing year, it's become a bit different. Like, yeah. thankfully, the finals have been so unbelievable against Mayo that yeah. even just the sheer thrill of beating them by a point and after a replay and everything meant there was euphoria. But, um, yeah, of course it's different. Like, we've Alan Brogan in the semi-final wishing Galway had scored that penalty. We're, yeah. we're, 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 we're in a situation that we haven't known in Gaelic games for 40 years. Yeah. I mean, you can equate it a bit to, to Kilkenny Hurlers 10 years ago. Yeah. I actually do think Dublin are kind of in a Kilkenny 07, 08 kind of state of mind now. Or Dublin, sorry, Dublin are the same set of mind that Kilkenny were that time. Yeah, you'd you'd wonder what the final will be like because I mean it is a, it is a nagging thing with them to absolutely nail a final, nail their final performance. And if Dublin nailed their final performance against someone, I think um, them, and right. I felt a long way back that this had the potential to be their easiest All Ireland. Mm. Mm. Unfair to call any of them easy, but even I remember at the start of the year looking around and we had Billy Joe Padden on, and I said I kind of feel they're six, seven, eight points better than anyone at yeah, least. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, "Yeah, this could be the one that they they trot home." It's goals. Yeah. It's go if you can go if you can score goals against them. Like that was that was the excitement yesterday. Was yeah. when Comer got a goal, then they had a chance at the penalty. Yeah. If you get a couple of goals, I, I always thought God were going to have to score at least three goals to win this game. Yeah, yeah. and they got they got two, but as you say, one was in garbage time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like they lost by twelve points to Tur or they beat Tyrone by twelve points last year. Only for that goal, it would have been the same yesterday. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so that's what we're talking about. Like I don't think there's a wider issue and in a few years time if it's Dublin against Mayo in a semi-final and no one can call it yeah, I think yeah. we'll have 80,000 and unbelievable yeah. uh, well, you know, well, search for tickets and of course like Galway do have an All-Ireland final next week I think all the factors you mentioned Yeah of course yeah, but, but there's another factor that should be worrying for the rest though if you do want more competitive championships as you look at the age profile Bart, Stephen Clux and a couple mm. of the others most of them are three or four years if not more off their peak mm. like the likes of Brian Fenton uh, Conor Callaghan, Brian Howard, etc. They're going to get a lot better. Yeah, yeah. far better than. But there. I think I think we're all in agreement, or correct me if I'm wrong, that it's still brilliant because the type of football they play, yeah. the standards they're setting, like they're the, a brilliant brand leader for the thing. Like conversion yeah. rate is now in the high 60s, which is unprecedented yeah. for for shot conversion. Like, if you're going to have dominance, you want them to be dominated. That's what you want. Yeah, yeah. That's that's how you want football to be played. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's like Spain. I keep going back to Spain, 2010, 2012. Some people are saying they're boring because they were just on a different level. Yeah. that wasn't boring. It was just an incredible team that nobody else could get near. Yeah. So, and Dublin are not on that plane now, I think. And it's and it's equally boring. To kind of say it's just up to the other 
teams yeah, to yeah. come up to the level, but that's what it is, and it'll make them a hell of a lot better for it, you know? Yeah. Podcast listeners will know if it's Monaghan or Tyrone in the final this stage. We don't know, regardless of who it is. What are we talking? Five, six, seven point win in the final? I'd say at least. Uh, probably, yeah. 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 Um, all yeah. things being right. The, all things being right, yeah. I mean, I, what, you know, what, what will be an issue come to time is whoever it is, they'll go, they're going to be rookies in all, 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 all Ireland final. Yeah. Whereas Dublin have obviously done it all. You're talking about the red carpet under your feet, like, you know, Toronto Man are going to be. These lads, the these lads live in a red carpet. They right? do. <laughs> they do. They have them in their houses and everything. Other GA stuff. So we mentioned Kerry. You've got Paul Galvin's piece in front of you there making the yeah. Sunday Times. So he's talking about two. He's, he touches on the hate mail issue, which is run this week. And then he has a pretty interesting point about the club scene in Kerry, which I hadn't thought of before. Yeah, he's kind of making the point. And I suppose he's looking at the, the nearest urban area to him. He's from he's from Fenuig in North Kerry. So the nearest the nearest big town to him is Tralee. Um, there's 22,000 people in the urban area of Tralee. Um, he's just saying there's just basically too many clubs in the area for 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 such a small for such a small area. So that's diluting their ability to produce players, and um, it's 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 affecting the uh, the competitiveness, I suppose, of the championship overall. So um, it's an interesting one. It's, it, it is it is an interesting one. It's kind of like a lot of there's a lot of bits and pieces in Kerry um, that they need to consider, and that is that is one of them. Like we would have always looked down the years at the club game in Kerry and said the one thing that the Kerry the Kerry footballers get is loads of games. Because that was a complaint under Fitzmaurice, wasn't it, that they hadn't played any club football? Well, the, the, there was there was issues around guys getting free to play club matches. That's for sure. Yeah, but just on the wider point that he's making about the club game, like I mean, there, if if you're playing club football in Kerry, you get tons of matches. Yeah. yeah. Um, now whether whether they're nearly playing too many matches is nearly more the issue down there, I think, than anything. But um, but yeah, like I mean, he's he's. He, I suppose Paul is looking at it from the point of view of developing elite footballers, you know, mm. and if you have, you know, too many clubs servicing a small area, that's obviously going to dilute the quality of the player you're producing. And he makes the same point for his own, own club, Fenuig. Fenuig would have also yeah. been Jimmy Dean in country back the years, and obviously himself. Um, he says they're in the midst of this decade's existential crisis. Every 10 years or so, all the looking backwards catches up on it. Yeah. Uh, oh, so you could call it legacy thinking. Interesting point on, like, the captaincy he mentions, like, they still have the old uh, traditional captaincy situation. Well, so their yeah. captain this year was Shane Murphy, the goalkeeper on the bench. And then his club mate is therefore stepped in in his place. So it's Gavin White and he's captain. And he says between them, in their debut seasons, they have eight championship starts between them. This practice is no help to a manager and has to change No, I, I, No, that's utter nonsense. It's, because you yeah, do yeah. look at the impact, you know, that Cluxton makes as captain with Dublin. And Michael Murphy, Donegal, Killian O'Connor, the last few years of Mayo. I don't know how they sustain that. Like, I, I think the club thing can be overstated. Like, there's a fair few counties over the years that have been very competitive into county level. I mean, like Don Donegal, I know very well. Donegal club football is, is very poor. Like, no Donegal clubs ever won the Ulster Club Championship, yeah. for example. Yeah. But you don't need it. Uh, and, like, there's a bit too much of it on the pro mouth in this to me, to be honest. Like, they have won four minor titles. They have put in David Clifford in his first year, who's been in Footballer of the Year form, if you look at his stats. Yeah. Mm. Sean O'Shea, Gavin White, Tom O'Sullivan. Like, new fellas have come in that look really good, and there's more to come. Yeah. So, so like if you look at outside of Dublin, if you're going to be a manager so you can take any county at the moment, you would grab it, you would jump at the Kerry job. Yeah. Like it's the most attractive job out there it's, right now. It's, it's the most attractive job, it's also the hardest job, but I mean, for, well, for, I know, for all I know, good reasons. Turlough you know? O'Brien answered you in this, I Twitter, saw, try, yeah. try managing in Division 4. And I, but I, <laughs> I, and I thought about that before, before I put it up, I, I put up that the, the Kerry job was the hardest job in, did I say Irish sport or, or Gaelic games? I can't remember. Well, let's say Irish sport, Irish sport. Irish let's go all out. I thought you said European sport, to be honest. European sport, do you know what? Sport. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, no, but like the point is, like if if Carlo go well, for example, this year, I mean, there, there wasn't any expectation or pressure on Carlo sure. to win a game, you know, uh, and they were fantastic and they did it, and you know, for all, and they did a fantastic job. This crowd, like, you know, it's it's an all Ireland or nothing, and that in the modern era is ludicrous for Kerry. I think, I mean, we don't want to kind of dwell on the whole thing. I mean, I think there's been. There's been a huge overrating of the players that Kerry have at their disposal. Mm. The guys coming through, you're absolutely right, you're very good. But the guys that they have been dealing with for the last four or five years, he saw he did very, very well. Like yeah. I mean, there's there's that aspect of it. I think as well, going back to Paul's point about the existential crisis, I, I, he's right. I mean, Kerry to me, for for everything they've won, they have been a reactive county for pretty much about a century now. They react to stuff. Yeah. They reacted to Down in the 60s, right? They reacted to Dublin getting really fit in the 70s, brought up to another level, you know? They reacted to, I suppose they reacted to Cork in a way in the 90s. Um, and they reacted to Tyrone. They reacted, you know, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. this kind of stuff. They're reacting to Dublin so they're now. Not quite the innovators. 
the, the only time they were ever innovators was when Dick Fister wrote a book in 1920 mm. something yeah. about 1914. He was, was there. It 19, yeah, yeah. God. Like with you know, kind of the positional grid and and who you stay in your you stay in your square and you kick the ball away if it comes near you. Yeah. It was revolutionary at the time, but it, it was at least the first time a training manual really had been mm. put together. But since that, because they've had so much success, they can be comfortable enough to say, well, what we're doing is right and we shouldn't change it. And it's yeah, still yeah. happening now. And you see that it's even with now. the last All-Ireland that won, that they won. They won it by copying the team they were playing yeah. in the final. Like yeah. They mirrored them in the final. Like they react to what's out there. And yeah, you it's, say, it's a very good point. And it's but you know, the, the pressure thing, I, I do find interesting. The, 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 it's obviously a hugely pressurised job. But I look at somebody like Andy McEntee, who came into a county that was used to being ha having huge success under Sean Boyle and at a low ebb. And the pressure, like we saw the pressure when they lost to Tyrone, how he reacted with the referee yeah. and in his interviews. Like there's, there's pressure in a lot of managers. Like yeah. it's not a, I, I, you know I, I don't know if there's more in Kerry, to be honest. Maybe it's apples know. and oranges a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's like the pressure that's in Kerry is just a constant thing to, to silverware. You yeah. know? Well, Mark O'Shea, to pick up on the theme in the Mail on Sunday, says Mick O'Dwyer's punchline that Kerry were always at a disadvantage because they have to play against 31 and a half counties is funny because it's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's his sense. Uh, he's very unhappy at the treatment Fitzmaurice is getting, uh, basically. He talks about the ugly underbelly <coughs> that uh, the fallout revealed, talks about the hate mail. The f he wondered maybe should Fitzmaurice have said anything because you're giving fools their moment in the sun and he paints a picture of one of these fools turning to his wife and saying, I wrote one of those letters and he hopes that the wife turned around and called him pathetic. <coughs> but he says, I don't perceive his reign to be error strewn or the disaster which others, notably Pat's plan, perceived it to be. He says, Pat came out with the cheap line that Kerry's game plan under Fitzmaurice was like Theresa May's Brexit strategy in that one did not exist. And then he says, seriously, I sat through Eamon's video sessions when he was a selector under Jack O'Connor and the detail both frightened and illuminated. To suggest that he did not have a game plan is nonsense. The principles never change. You had to earn the right to play ball. And when you did, it was moved quickly to the inside forwards. He says, Spillane also suggested that we had no kick-out strategy. Utter nonsense. We always did. Fitzmaurice had as much success, perhaps more than any other, on putting pressure on Stephen Cluxton and innovatively made us uh, press up after set plays to save lungs and legs with some effect in 2016. It was quite memorable, that game, actually, that they did that. And he says, on our own kick-outs, there was always a strategy. The problem is with that we didn't possess the quality to execute it. I must say, I did watch Spillane give this no game plan line, and it was just patently not true. Not like, it was correct. madness that he was getting away not with correct. saying this yeah, on TV. Yeah, yeah. Should, he should have been challenged more in the studio, I felt. Like, Fitzmaurice clearly was a game plan type manager. He had different game plans for different well, games. Like, he had, like, the kick-out strategy, that Dublin game that um, O'Shea references, the 2016 <laughs> semi-final. Like, again, remember Cluxton, five in a row. Yeah, that's happened a few times. times. They did that a few times to Dublin yeah, over yeah, the years. Yeah, there's no team at that level going out without no. a game plan, without going, going out without three or four different I'm game plans. I'm delighted someone like O'Shea has actually just pierced that nonsense yeah, for what yeah. it was, because he was trying to spout it again yesterday, and it was just, it's just just not true. No. Yeah. Like it's funny. I, I, can't, I can't name, but I know one individual who started uh, who was a league game this year. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, he was he substituted really early in the game because he didn't follow the game plan. Yeah. That's an important yeah. game plan. Yeah. This was a for Division Kerry. One team. No, no. With the, I'm not. I'm not going to go into okay, it. Okay, fair enough. But uh, th that's an important game plans. Now, well, manager, see if you're not doing what you're told, you're, you're going to be hooked. Yeah. Like the, At yeah. the notion that he won in All Ireland with a game plan. Uh, this comes back to what I was saying before about the quality of the player. I mean. <sighs> He won an All-Ireland in 2014. That was a real manager-led All-Ireland, I think, in a lot of ways, right? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, it was more the games, I think, against Dublin that probably maybe rattled him a little bit, maybe shook his trust in both the game plan and the players he had at his disposal, and it all kind of comes together. Like, but, I mean, to say, like, no game plan. <laughs> Where are you even going with that? Like? I don't know. You know. God bless him. Like, where are you going with That's that? That's easy criticism to throw out, and then you it's don't have to do real analysis. Just like, you know. it's like the hate mail, as it's been billed, or uh, thing is, it's interesting because. It's, a, it's just a reflection of the way the world we live in. Like, you get it in yeah. social media. Like, the most innocuous comment, like, uh, as you do when you're watching a game, you make it, the odd observation, just throw it on Twitter. And I just, it's something innocent yesterday, like, I love watching Ian Burke, you know, like, he's a class act. And a few hours later, Aidan O'Shea... Controversial. No, yeah, yeah. But Aidan O'Shea replied, uh, yeah, he's a great player to watch, somebody you'd love to play alongside, I guess. And somebody replied to him with a homophobic slur. Wow, yeah. Like there's that kind of permanent yeah, yeah. anger there, and you're going. Sorry, I say oh. why was it from shocked? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, that's, but like Aidan O'Shea, right. I was just thinking, how, how often does Aidan O'Shea get that kind of crap? Yeah, like yeah. it's just it's... over nothing, and then uh, like extra physical letters. I don't know if you got many over the years, Michael, but I got a few. But like, most of them were kind of innocent enough. They just said, "You clown, you know nothing yeah. about Mourinho or rugby or." 
Dub and GA or whatever. Mm. But you do, like I got one 20 years ago, and I'd written something about sport in the North, but it just two lines, it said, keep out of politics, stick to the sport. And it had a photograph of a guy in a balaclava with a machine gun. So I, I, I went to a friend of the garden and said, should I do anything with that? And I said, I said just, just leave it. Like, if you, if you hear from me again, like, come back to me. But, but, you know, those are the things that make you, you know, that go to an extreme. Most of it, you just brush it off as cracks, yeah. I think, mm. you know. It's just, it's, it's always been there. You know, it's always been there. I mean, in the Kerry context, it's been there forever. Like, I mean, he, he, was, he was right to bring it up, I think. I think he was, right, he was right to bring it up, and it's good that it's kind of been aired a little bit. But I mean, you know, it's it's um, it's not something we can do anything about. It's not you can do about. It. What strikes me actually about it is in an era when you have so many kind of routes to um, abuse somebody, I suppose, between yeah. social media and everything else. I mean, to sit down, take the trouble to get out a piece of paper, get your green biro, write your write your mail, get get a stamp from your carer or whatever, yeah. go to get permission to go to the post office and send it. Like the worst, there's a, a lot of thought goes into that. The worst know? thing I find about the letters is that they have your address. Yeah, that's yeah. the part that just well, makes you think. Ooh. Yeah, you know, I, you don't no, like that yeah, information yeah. being out no, there. No, that's terrible. It just reminds me of what I was sent to you outside. I think peak hate mail, like really, you know, you've, you know, you you you're striking a card if you get hate mail like Pat Spillane did many many years ago. That was just stressed. Pat Bollocks, Kerry. Yeah, and it arrived. Yeah, and the postman knew where to take it. Like <laughs> funny, um, Mark O'Shea on the hate mail thing remembers Potty getting hate mail and how he would try and he'd get everybody around the kitchen table. He said, come here and look, with this, look at what this uh, Amadon is after uh, Amadon is after writing. And he said he'd have a big belly laugh about it. Now he says, um, it looked like it was water off a duck's back, although Mark says maybe it wasn't, but he was determined not to let anyone know that he wouldn't be cowed by rough language. Yeah, I mean, but he, he did bring up in that body. interview with Kevin Kimmage in the Sunday Endo, that quote that's been, you know, has been recycled so much this week, you know, the roughest type of effing animals you could meet. Yeah. You know, and that, 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 you know, so it did get to him at some, at some level, I think, when, when you consider that level. And if you go back even a few years before that, he, he used to do the odd interview back in the late 90s. And I remember Vinnie Murphy was below there and there was talking yeah. of Vinnie playing for Kerry. And he was talking one time about Vinnie playing and he, the interviewer, he picked up the tape recorder and said, Is that, can, we, can, 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 can we do this interview with this off, like, you know? And he said, no, not, not, not really, though. So turn around again, what do you think of Vinnie? Well, you know, well, Vinnie's one of a lot of players looking at, but what he was saying to him off the record was, like, you've no idea what people are like down here. You've no idea what they're saying yeah. about me, about the decisions I'm trying to, about the team, the decisions I have to make, about Vinnie Murphy, about everything. Mm. Yeah. Like, it's, it, it is, like, my, my wife is from Dingle. I spent a lot of time in Kerry. I, I, mean, I know it's the nature of my job, I suppose, as well, that football will come up, but I mean, literally, like, I mean, the football comes straight into the conversation. And, and the problem with that is, so quickly. more so than, say, Premier League, where at least there's a weekly diet, more than a weekly diet, there are so few games at inter-county level, and Last there's so much talking over. time. Yeah. Even the smallest thing, you know, there's weeks of debate and something. Yeah, and, there's a, and a sense of entitlement is a problem. Like, if you are, if you do have this assumption that you should win the All-Ireland yeah. every two years out of every three, yeah. and you see that in other countries, like, say, Tipperary, you see it as well. It's, it's a toxic thing. Like, Makes it very volatile, it's completely, yeah. Um, it's completely unrealistic in the modern world to, to, to have that kind of expectation, I think. Someone made the point during the week, um, just some, some, some guy in Twitter made the point that it was just, what was most disgraceful about it was that, do, that Kerry had been edged out by two ordinary teams, like yeah. Galway and Manon. Mm. Yeah. And you're like, there's nothing ordinary about yeah. Galway. In fact, Manon are extraordinary, yeah. Yeah. you know? But look, that's what you're Shane McGrath had a good point as well in his piece where he was just saying we can put this down to social media. But he's like, I mean, mainstream media has always played its part as well. And he's yeah, like, absolutely. some of the stuff yeah. that the so What of done say, what newspaper columnists right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Tough. Yeah. Yeah. That's the tone. There's an exclusive in the Sunday World, or they yeah. say it's an exclusive. So Katie Taylor, pages yeah. two and three of the Sunday World. <coughs> Effectively, there's a new documentary, Katie, coming out in yeah, yeah. October. Ross Whitaker involved. He did the yeah. Saviour's documentary. And, and when Ali came to Ireland as yeah, well. And do you know, did a brilliant little documentary on surfing last year. Yeah, down yeah. In the West did Coast on Ireland. the Hench, yeah, yeah. Beautifully shot. It was just gorgeous. So there are some quotes from the documentary. I know you were saying she was doing some interviews yesterday. Yeah, there, and there's some quotes from that yesterday. I think, she, and I think Donald Clark in the, in the Irish Times film critic interviewed her as well from what he, if I saw a tweet. And like Esther is a film critic and she has a few quotes from yesterday and then a few from the film. And like Ross will be a friend of mine and like I have to declare an interest in one of the talking heads in the documentary. So uh, I actually haven't seen it. I'm look, really looking forward to it. But I, I went to a few of Katie's fights and went for a few pints with Ross and some of the stuff he told me about it will open people's eyes to aspects of where they've never s seen before. Like, 
they would have heard him maybe talking about her faith or people, or other people reference her. But like he has shots, he's got incredible access. Like uh, before fights, in the hotel room with her mother, both of them praying before fights, and Katie bawling her eyes out. Like she gets so emotional and uh, and uh, uh, and overwhelmed by it. Like it's and uh, stuff about her training routine. Like I guarantee, when you see it, nobody in Irish sport trains harder. Like not the rowers, not no rugby player, no athlete. Like it's it's savage stuff, and it because uh, there is a bit of I find at times a bit of revisionism with Katie, or not revisionism, but um, people are reluctant to give her credit. Like they keep saying stuff that there's not the depth in boxing, and uh, or that some of her opponents have full time jobs. Well, the reality in pro boxing and male pro boxing as well, loads of the fighters, the majority of them have, aren't, aren't full-time, they have uh, other jobs on the side. There were, there were four cha world champions with belts, reigning world champions with belts, she's beaten two of them. She's taken two of the belts, she wants to fight the others and she will in time, and she's not ducking any fights. Like it's, I think she's a remarkable person, and uh, I think she's the, been the biggest game-changer ever in Irish sport, like literally has changed the sport because it wouldn't even be an Olympic sport with either. Yeah. Uh, one thing I find interesting, I've asked you about this before, is she a feminist? And she's really reluctant to say she is. I say, I, and, and to me, well, she's the ultimate feminist, like uh, in, in terms of the fight for equality and how she's <laughs> got uh, what women's boxing to, to the level it's at. Why do you think she's reluctant to, I don't know, just I doesn't so, want to go down I think some people see that as a, road. for some reason they think there's a stigma to that label. Yeah. I think some people think that way. I don't think there is <gasps> in the slightest, but she oh, just I seems I think reluctant. Think she's I, I think feminism has a stigma. Do you? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, you're going to get in trouble now for saying that. No, I think it is. I mean, it what can, way? It can be unfairly so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it is. I think it, it it is dismissed as angry, hateful terrain. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, if you look at what feminism is, it's yeah. Core, there's a cartoonish version of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah, people like have a particular angry mob yeah, go yeah. burn your bras. That kind of you know the, yeah, the, all yeah. the cliches. So I think it does have a stigma. Okay, she but uh, but in this piece now, it's interesting. She does mention. Uh, because she hasn't talked about Pete and the split with Pete. Mm. And, um, and uh, there's quotes in the film, the first time she had to go training without him, she's driving in by herself and the tears were rolling down her face. I just felt like every time I was stepping into the ring without my dad at that time, I was missing an arm. Mm. Mm. And that is stark because the bond yeah. was so strong. Yeah, yeah. They have, they have that quote actually, I'll just hold it up. Yeah, yeah. The camera. That's, the, that's the big quote they kind of lead with, that's the, the strap line headline. Yeah. The missing an arm line without yeah. her dad. And her brother in the documentary talks about, they found out about the issues, I suppose. You yeah. almost feel like it's too private to even yeah, yeah. talk but about. That's, but that's actually what's often struck they, me about they, that. They found out before the Olympics that there was yeah. marital issues, and then you know that. But that's one of the extraordinary things about this documentary because it does document the year or the the, or the two years since Rio when she was like I was in the mix zone in Rio when she was beaten and she comes out, and it's one of those times you go. I don't really like the job. I don't want to be here. You want to leave her alone. She yeah. was so she was so upset, and even some of the stuff she was saying, you know, it's been such a tough year. Mm. And you know, she wasn't just talking about the boxing defeats. Mm. There was yeah. more. And you're going, no, this is, you know, just leave her alone. It's too close. You know, it's too. It's too I know raw. that's the job you have to ask her and you have to be there. But you just saw somebody was in real pain there. It must have been so raw at that time. Yeah. I think it's difficult. it's particularly we say for like yourself, no, Kieran. I mean, I sat down which is ten years ago. No, since I sat down with Katie. But I can still, I mean, it's one of those interviews that kind of sticks in your head. Like yeah. when you get even slightly close to the work that she's doing and kind of you know what, you, you, kind of you can see in her face, in the way she's talking, you, when you know the work she's doing behind the scenes, as you said there, like, you just, you just, you can't but wish the best for her. So when things kind of go wrong, and particularly pr profoundly life-changing things yeah. go wrong, it's just, as you say, it feels almost um, intrusive, like, yeah, to yeah. even have to go there. Um, and this documentary will do well, won't it? It will, like, and it's getting a full rich. cinema release, yeah. which is really unusual See, for a documentary. See, I think everybody in our society knows Katie well, respects they feel like they do anyway. and actually you know, will want but to it's get funny, this is an argument better. I often like have uh, with the desk. Like, people will say, uh, you know, like, I, I might, because I've gone to a few of the fights, I might say, there's, there's another fight coming up, Can, you know, I'd like to go to this, and yeah. they say, ah, nobody cares. But uh, nobody cares about women's boxing or whatever. And yeah. I said, well, even if they don't care about women's boxing, they're really interested in Katie Taylor. I think yeah. there is a distinction. Yeah. Oh, like, I think she has this status in Irish sport and, and Irish life 
the, like, nobody can, most people can't mention any other woman boxers, but no. they're very interested in what she does. But non UFC fans still are interested in Conor McGregor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for very different reasons. Yeah. yeah. Non women's boxing fans are very yeah. interested in Katie. So. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's, she's apart from her sport. She's, she a, she's is, yeah. a brand in inverted commas apart from her sport, but she's more than that. Like, I mean, she's a person of very serious substance. I mean, whether you're a religious person or not, I mean, the, like, she's all about conviction. I think that's what. I like about her anyway is that conviction in her beliefs. Whether it's her conviction in the belief that she can be the best in yeah. the world, even if even if they're you know even if the sport is considered not to be the, the opponents aren't of it, she just goes at it as though yeah. they're the greatest fighters no, in the well, world. What's interesting as well is she's, she's an incredibly person. private person, yeah. living a very public life, yeah. and there is that uh, she finds that very difficult, and she no makes doubt. no secret yeah. of it. But when you, the more you get to know her and talk to her, she's got this kind of dry subtle sense of humor like she's quite she can be quite funny and yeah. uh, she can be good company but she just she has to put herself out there and sell herself in the pro game and she hates that she, mm. she, she finds that like very that, very yeah. hard yeah. and particularly like the last fight and she was asked on the eve of it she was asked about pete being shot and she had to kind of answer you know and it's just like this the more stuff had happened mm. you know obviously and it's been very, very difficult for her. But like, uh, she said, uh, for, from what I gather, she's really happy with the documentary. And there's an interesting line in that piece. She approached Ross to do it. She wanted this out there. She wanted a document of herself rather than a book. Like I know she did a kind of a book after the Olympics, her Olympic story with Johnny yeah. Watterson. But I think she she was a big fan of Saviors. Did you see Saviors? Saviors was yeah, like yeah, standing, it's a brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Standing. Um, so and she she really says she's watched that a few times, so yeah, she's yeah. familiar with Ross's work. And yeah. I guess you put your documentary up there. I mean, it's it's a bit like the Players Tribune and all these kind of different yeah, elements yeah. now. It, that that there's no misinterpretation there. This is just yeah. it, like straight to the viewers. And there must be an appeal in that when so much of your life is through newspapers and quotes mm. and headlines. well, there isn't. There isn't. I mean, there's an editing process as well that goes through when you do sure. a documentary. But I, I you know, if, 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 if you're working in tandem with the filmmaker, yeah. then it's a different story. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's in October, so I guess we'll be talking about. Yeah, that it's again. it's uh, it's beforehand. It's in the there's a documentary film festival in the IF. C or IFI, whatever it's called now, in September, and it's right. on. There's a showing there beforehand in Dublin. Okay, I presume you've <coughs> been gripped by the golf. The US PGA is on golf's fourth major, a well, sport desperate to try and call yeah, back well, some we of the Yeah, we were talking about this, and it, I think it just shows you because just going from boxing, like one of the reasons that boxing went from 20 million regular viewerships on a Saturday night to disappearing from most people's consciousness was because the way it disappeared off television and went pay per view. Yeah, and. I, I think, I, I genuinely think a lot of people didn't realise the PGA was on because it's gone to this obscure website. Eleven Sports, yeah. Whose production values, I have to say, are lacking. They're not up to your standards, Sean. I mean, they're taking the US feed, which in itself is okay. I mean, you get Nick Faldo and various good people on that. But then they cut back occasionally to the presenter and Jamie Donaldson is in what can only be described as a radio studio come bunker. And Not like this now, Joe. I mean, this honestly, is no bunker. I was, I was, I was texting uh, Nathan Murphy last night saying, "We like they should have used our studio. <laughs> 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 like, this looks like five star compared to that." Uh, no, they were they're just. In, it's basically a set camera in the corner, right. a bit like where you put a camera set in a car on the dashboard to just. Video. So it's one camera in the studio looking down on the two of them. And they're in a studio, which is just kind of a, a radio studio. Nothing on the walls except for some kind of cardboard Eleven Sports logos, which have been, I would presume, blue tacked on the walls behind them. Right. It's kind of like Alan Partridge meets <laughs> Eleven Sports. <laughs> so uh, it's really, I mean, it's terrible, but if you want to watch it. Sounds great. Watch, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds fantastic. David Walsh says, live on your laptop tonight, golf fans. Broadcast newcomers uh, target young viewers with affordable alternative to rival uh, fees and some dodgy fees. David Walsh has spoken to one of the owners. Mm. Uh, Andrea Radzianzi, the uh, Leeds owner, and Mark Watson are the two men involved. Mark Watson was at BT for a while. And I mean, they're launching, they're in 11 countries, soon to be more. They're launching in Portugal this week. Watson says they have 15 million paying subscribers. I mean, look, the coverage is, is, is terrible. And it's, this is dreadful for golf because no one is watching this thing. Ironically, you can watch it for free because you get a week's trial, but no, yeah. one's, no one's gone to the trouble. Yeah. He says, though, uh, the wider point about TV and money his argument is, if you look at what Sky ultimately do, he says their role is an aggregator of content. So they go out, they get everything, they buy it up and they package it and then they turn around to you and say, look, we've done all the work for you, 70 quid a month, hand it over and yeah, you get yeah. everything. But he, he does make the very fair argument, are they maintaining the value of their offering? To do that, they've got to keep all the content. And if things like La Liga and European rugby are lost, does it reach a point where consumers have had enough? 
And I mean, we may be reaching that point. And he does talk interestingly about the music industry where, and I think we're at that point now with sport, aren't we? He says, music industry going along lovely and then piracy almost destroys the business. And in the end, it's saved by Spotify and Apple Music to a point where he says, uh, young people will pay when it's affordable and a good product. He says, that is where sport has to go. Yeah, yeah. Which is very interesting. It, it, uh, most people I know are watching stuff legally. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we come back to a point where, okay, you think, well, like the streams are a bit dodgy at times or you want to be able to record stuff and that's yeah. not always possible. Yeah. So, do you know what? 15 euro a month, 10 euro a month, yeah. I'll pay that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's, we're, we're at the cusp of something in sport and I don't actually know where it's no, I th going I th to go. I think that's, that, that, is, that is definitely the case. And like, that's why I find this really interesting, bringing up the Spotify model. That's the one, isn't it? Yeah, because like, I, I find this now, like, uh, I work from home, you work from home, Nick, as well. And like, if you have a break for a coffee or something, you're flicking through the channels. And I only subscribe to Sky Sports. I don't bother with BT, etc. Because when you subscribe to Netflix and I subscribe to Amazon Prime, I'm like, you, you can't watch everything. You have to pick and choose. Yeah. But I find like Sky has too many sports channels now. It's very clear to me. Like you flick around and you'll see they're repeating a League One playoff final or Premier League years from 97, 98. You're thinking, who's watching that? Like it's just filler. A lot of it is filler. So the model is, like, I remember when I signed up to Spotify, at the start it took the free thing with the ads. Yeah. And then I'd for a few weeks, I thought, oh, it's only a few quid. I'll yeah, just do it with here, no yeah. ads. Yeah. And I think that's the way with sport. If you make it, like, I don't even know what Spotify is now, probably 10 hour a month or something. It's, it's very reasonable. Yeah. But if you make sport that affordable, I think the, it will kill the illegal streams. You know, that is the way forward. I also think there's an aspect of, I mean, one of the things that would be very attractive in terms of Spotify to, young, to younger listeners, we'd say as well, is the fact that you can tailor your music. Like, you yeah. don't have to have the whole album. And I think that transfers over to sport here as well. Like, Sky Sports is quite an old model in its own, mm. its own way. It's a TV channel. 1992 now is the... Yeah. And I mean, the model was around before that as well. Yeah. So but, it just, just, but just the idea that you have TV listings. And that's what you get. So as opposed to being able to pick and choose the bits you want. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, that's, that's where it's going, I would have thought. You know, I mean, how they actually make that <laughs> work with all the various different sporting bodies and all their various different vested interests, I don't know. But that's, that's probably where it's going. But it's an interesting one. Uh, I find it interesting even the last week, how much, or the last 10 days, whatever it was, how many hours RT committed to the European Championships? Yeah. Like they committed to, they gave it Olympic style coverage. It was mm. 15, 16 hours a day, close on, I would think. And, um, and, uh, and then you see like with TV3, you know, you, you obviously have involved Joe, like they're going to more or less an exclusive sports channel now, aren't they? Yeah, Virgin Sports. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it is a period of great flux and change, like mm. and how it all pans out to be fascinating. But it's interesting like, to, you know, to have just that little confluence of those three sports, like golf, athletics, boxing, like, yeah, well, yeah. as you said, like boxing on terrestrial TV was a dream, you yeah. know, even athletics on terrestrial television. Yeah, yeah. Remember they used to have like, you know, racing from Zurich and all those, yeah, those all Diamond the, League. The, yeah, the, the equivalent of the yeah, Grand Prix meetings, Grand the equivalent of Diamond League now. On, yeah, on, yeah, they on, used to on a Wednesday on. night, like all yeah. live, you know, and it was yeah. fab, you know, I mean, it really yeah. got an audience, you know. Um, of course, it was a time when there was very little sport on television relative to now, but still it was, it was putting it out there in front yeah, of people, yeah. golf, the same. So the more you go back behind these, especially yeah. for sports like that, and especially, I suppose, from a media point of view, at a time when the, when the big beasts are taking all the space, like, it's very easy to ignore athletics, like, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you want to, it's fairly easy to downgrade the golf if you want oh. to. Well, Shane yeah. Larry's tied for fourth or fifth, he's level with Tiger Woods and eight under, and he's gone into a Sunday at a major, mm. and it's nowhere. Yeah, well, part, you know what part of that is, well, Joe? I think uh, the GA calendar is part of it. Sure. I think the GA calendar is messy because it's been too busy. There's just too much on every week too, uh, uh, of a massive yeah. scale. Like going from last week's Super 8s, final week of Super 8s, plus a hurling semi-final replay, two football semi-finals this week, hurling final next week. Mm. And, it's, uh, and then that's coinciding with the start of the Premier League. Yeah. So even something as big as the US PGA is getting squeezed. Yeah. And particularly with you have this European Championship uh, on as well, which has become... Yeah. Which wasn't there before as a combined event. So and is, it's is there one potential issue for sport and sports broadcasting, though, in that Spotify have everything. So it's a lovely catch-all. You give your tenor a month, you get everything. In sport, like so much of the value is the exclusivity. Like the reason 11 Sports have paid the USPGA seven and a half million is because that's the only place you can get it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the pr I think the real issue, what's bugging people now is suddenly they used to have everything on Sky and now it's become fractured. And yeah, like, the, the other thing, if you go down the Spotify I'll, model, sorry, yeah. Oh yeah, no, finish I'll just, Well, I'll just finish yeah. the point. So everything's suddenly fra fractured. So maybe some people then paid for BT as well as their Sky 
and now 11 Sports come along or something else yeah, come yeah. along and you're like, well, I'm not paying for that as yeah, well. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, the point. Yeah, but, yeah. So will we ever, like, companies like 11 Sports are going to insist on exclusivity. So I do wonder, when we're not going to reach a point, a Spotify type sport thing where you pay 15 a month and get all the sport because... I think sport's going to stay fractured. I think certain yeah, channels... I will think, think, that's yeah, 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 yeah. I think you, you, you'll get a soccer package or a rugby package or whatever. Yeah. And it, it will become... You'll be, you, there won't be as many general sports fans, I think, because people won't fork out for mm. four or five different mm. subscriptions. But, but how know, would that work you, in a Sky and BT world? Because BT will say, well, we want these games. If you want the half, five games on a Saturday, you're coming to us. And Sky will say, well, we've got all the other games. Yeah. But They're the Sky BT world together. might be disappearing, though. Well, maybe, yeah. No, I or, might, or might be changing dramatically. Like the other thing is important. Uh, a lot of musicians, well, virtually all musicians, despise the Spotify they model They're getting because they nothing. get pettings out of it. Right. So if, if sport goes down that route, they mightn't be getting anything. If they want accessibility and the numbers in terms of audience, they mightn't be getting anything like the money they've got from Sky BT over the years. So. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we'll see how it all pans out. Um, some other bits and pieces. Here. By the way, yeah, Shane Lowry's doing very well. Tiger Woods is doing well. Brooks Kepka is the leader. Uh, we'll probably touch on it on tomorrow's show or certainly Tuesday. Kieran McGeehan's running this evening. I mean, yeah, I just wanted to bring this. Pod, just <coughs> a war, podcasters will have seen this race. Okay. <laughs> so, you know. So, I just want to talk, just on a, on a general point of view about the European Championships, it's. Um, and with the same with the Worlds last year in London, I really. I, because there are there are so many reasons to question athletics. We know that over the years of stuff that's happened, but it's brilliant to get a reminder of what amazing sport yeah, it can be. Like the crowds, crowds, and crowds can make it as well. Like London got pa the Olympic Stadium was packed last year. Sixty thousand in the stadium in Berlin last night, and you do see. I do think watching Thomas Barr the other night. There's still very few things in sport as thrilling as watching an Irish person win a major medal in mm. track and field. Because like, it's just, it's sport at its most, uh, not primitive level, but the simple, like running faster than somebody. You can't get much simpler than that. You don't need to you know. explain the rules. No, no. no. <laughs> but it's just, a, there's just a buzz from it. And, and, and particularly Thomas, I'm sure you've dealt with him, like most people have, have interviewed Thomas at this stage. But he's, if I was, if you, Athletics Ireland should be giving him 100 grand a year to go into schools. Kids would love him. Yeah. He has this incredibly infectious personality. That he just gets on with everybody. And Kira McGee is somebody he had a lot of time for. And she made a massive move, leaving Jer Jerry Kieran had moved to, to Manchester. To Manchester. And she said a rough time in major championships the last few years, but she looked really good in her semi final. This is a podcast, don't know how the final went. But she looks in good form. Well, I think so. in the final, only three that she will... So, Carl Dennehy makes the point. Yeah. Only three that she look across at, on the starting blocks have run faster than her this yeah, year. Yeah, she'll be giving herself a real chance. Yeah. And she has a real chance. She yeah. won bronze in the Europeans a couple of years ago. Yeah, And she then has had just terrible luck at major championships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And people like... I mean, her pedigree at underage level. I mean, we've got star here if she could... Yeah, on it. but like the, it's like Eamon Sweeney, uh, just on a broader point, like to tie in with the athletics thing uh, and the European Championships being on TV, this is, uh, Irish sport across the board has never been stronger. Like, uh, there's been medals delivered in the last few weeks, uh, tri everything from triathlon, rowing, uh, athletics, cycling. We saw what the hockey woman did getting the World Cup final. You know how good the rugby team are. Mm -hmm. Horse racing just cleans up all the time. Like the soccer is the one you're looking at at the moment that's that's not doing what we'd like it to. But mm. other across the board, for years we were always depending on a couple of sports for medals. Yeah. Now even boxing, like uh, Eamon yeah. lists it off there. The amount of boxing medals at underage now is just they're they're and even, up. even even the week that's in it. Like I mean, you, you know, there's two Irish boxers fighting for world titles yeah, yeah. and Frampton up. And there's hardly a word on Paddy Power fighting for world title. One of the major figures in, in Irish boxing the next last 20 years and we know why that is which is yeah. very sad now, mm. but, but like the, the the athletics thing I mean I, I've always thought that there's a sort of um, like a muscle memory in the Irish nation for athletics you know yeah. I mean going right back it's just in us yeah like the Martin Games and, her, uh, and the, Martin like the Martin Mile the, when uh, Herb, Herb Elliott wasn't it? it set the world record that, that 60th anniversary was last week Yeah. and if you ever see the crowd there's over 20,000 yeah. at Santry for it in the 50s, like it was like amazing. Ronnie Delaney used to fill, I did to go to see Ronnie Delaney running in Lanzone Road, like you know, he used to set up a track for him and he'd, he'd, yeah. he'd run in Lanzone Road. Is that Road. right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, even go back to the field events, you know, Pat Callan and all those guys, Bob Tizzle and the hurdles, yeah. like it's just there. And we were talking about, so, I mean, even, even your own, even in, in our own kind of lifetimes, or just about like we'll say John Tracy, yeah, yeah, all that stuff, it's it's all 
it's all there and you know again it was nice like to be able to flick on the tv and there's some athletics yeah you yeah, know yeah, yeah. without having to go digging for it you know it's great and i mean it's it's what those sports need to be about is is keeping it terrestrial i think yeah, or keeping yeah, yeah. it at least in whatever format getting themselves out to the the largest possible audience without completely selling themselves short but really they need to be out there because there is an opportunity for all of these sports you know yeah i think as a child, I didn't really appreciate that Sonia Sullivan was quite special, you I know, I was, I was a bit spoiled at the time, I was like, alright, yeah, great, again, so if you think here about, we go. But again, if you think about it, I mean, you're coming, we're, we're coming off an era there with all the guys in America as well, so I mean, Sonia was exceptional, but she was just, she was the most exceptional of an exceptional yeah, generation, absolutely. you know. Because the, the greatest night of Irish sport I've ever, or of sport I've ever been at, genuinely was... Okay, hang on. What was it? Katie Taylor? No, no, no. The most enjoyable was was Sonia. I was at there first when Sonia Sullivan won her silver in Sydney. That was your But best. just everything that happened, uh, like Michael Johnson uh, won four hundred meter in his final gold in his final ever race. Gabriel Selassie won the ten thousand meters in the final stride of an incredible race from Paul Terrigat of Kenya. Yeah. So there was all different. Like Kathy Freeman, I don't remember her mm, at four hundred yeah. meters nice. <coughs> because it was amazing. Because the pressure on her being an Aboriginal sure, yeah. athlete and uh, there was so much made of in Australia winning the four hundred meters. But uh, what struck me the other night watching the athletics was uh, Jake, uh, Jak is it Jakob or Jacob, I can't remember, Jakob Ingebrigtsen of Norway won the 1500 metres mm -hmm. title, right? At 17. Mm. He was born six days before Sonia's silver in Sydney. <laughs> so that made me feel very old. Yeah. But he's the yeah. third. Well, we are very old. But That's more about us than them, no. Both his brothers <laughs> have won it as well. The European right. Championship under 1500 in the last two. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Amazing They're an story. amazing family, yeah. Right, wow. Okay, well, we wish Kieran McGean well this evening. Um, the Sindo, just for the Liverpool fan here. Are there two Liverpool fans here? There's one anyway. Okay, for your sins, Mick Foley. This uh, is just I'll the kind of thing. As well, then. This is just the kind it's of thing. It's not a confession. Well. It's a. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a there's a pretense of being neutral. <laughs> Liverpool have just. Uh, obviously, Liverpool have spent the most in the transfer window. And as a use of space, this is just about six inches on the top right of page nine and they've gone through all Liverpool's managers since their last title win who they've bought and who they've sold and so they've done it in different categories 10 most expensive the big five who left good value and then at the end money for nothing and do you know what it's brilliant it's yeah, the kind it of it is. 15 minutes looking at and it brings back memories it brings it brings back 25 years of sort of just what why, how is he there? <laughs> Where did they find him? It's, a, it's a, the ultimate wall of shame, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The lads it, were here. We got, got into a kind of a circle of, uh, I don't know what you call circle of shame with Paul Howard and a few others on Twitter during the week about this, about yeah. putting in bids for Liverpool players and somebody was saying they have, uh, you know, you could put in a bid for them. Do so. Somebody was saying, uh, you know, I put in a bid for Sean Dundee a few years ago. You know, he helps around the house. I was saying I put in a, a, a bid three three packets of hula hoops in yesterday's Herald for Alberto Moreno. Yeah. Well, do you have a line about <laughs> East Van Cosma? Well, so Cosma, yeah, he's, he's on a plaque outside the... I was at a friendly in the, the stadium in Budapest, Ireland friendly. And they have a plaque outside of Hung Hungary Greats and Ispan Cosmas on it. But what jumps out at me... Uh, I'll just give, we have Kenny Dalglish, then Sunis, yeah. then Roy Evans, then Julier, then Benitez, then Hodgson, then Kenny Dalglish again, then Rogers, then Klopp. Who's coming out of this best? Klopp, that's what oh, I Klopp. think. Like a jump, Klopp has so signed very few flops. Yeah. You know. That's a bit of a right, but no, he. Uh, whether it's him or a transfer committee or whatever, they they tend to pay it off. And yeah, also, it's very interesting. He's offloaded, I think, twenty four players in the last two years. He's got rid of a hell of a lot of duds as well. You, know, you could yes. you could argue. Sorry to cut across you. You could argue in terms of the value aspect of it, right? Dog leash back in the eighties. It's a diff It's it's such a different era now. But some of the guys he bought that time in the late eighties were exceptional. Like I mean, he got Peter Beardsley, yeah. John Barnes. He got Aldridge. Uh, he brought Rush back. Yeah. Um, Ray Houghton. Houghton. I mean, Staunton for 20 grand. Yeah. Staunton but it's funny, grand, but that's that when time you realised that, that he was starting to slip is when he bought the likes of Jimmy Carter yeah, that and was David Speedy. I think that's when you knew something's up with yeah. him because he lost his touch a little bit. But I remember as a kid, like when they bought John Barnes for £900,000, that was gigantic money. Like, I mean, this was Liverpool spending money like they had never spent before okay. back that time okay. because they had always brought lads through and got like Alan Hansen for, you know, a set of tracksuits or whatever from some place up in Scotland, that kind of thing. Whereas, like, these are, I mean, he paid one million for Ronnie Rose and yeah. like, Ro Robbie Keane to Liverpool was 10 years ago. Yeah, it was 19 Dan, million. Wasn't yeah, it? Dan had a piece on it yesterday, and I, I, I just, uh, it's, I couldn't believe it was that long ago, but it just, it, it hammered, I think the tone of Dan's piece was like, 
that was the last big Irish transfer, mm. really. Like, yeah. a long, it says a lot, a long time ago now. Gerard Houllier's money for nothing section. Cissé, 14 million. Juff, 10 million. Kirkland, 6 million. Ziga, 5 million. Biscan, 5 million. Jow, 4.7. Oh. Vesterville, 4 million. The next Zidane, that's Sheru, 3.7 <laughs> <laughs> million. Oh, well, you'd have to laugh, wouldn't you, Joe? And then uh, Benitez went for Pennant, 6.7 million. Moriente, 6.3. Agar, 5.8. Sissoka, 5.6. But the great story about Pennant was, the, remember he bought a, a Porsche or a Ferrari and he forgot he owned oh, it. He left it, right. parted out to the train more, yeah. station some for two years. That's right, that's right. <laughs> In terms of good value, like Kenny, so like Kenny Douglas second time around, Money for Nothing reads badly. Carroll, 35 million. Downing, 20 million. Um, Charlie Adams, seven and a half million. Kawhi eight million. Yeah. In fairness, for his good value, Suarez for twenty-two million and Henderson sixteen million and Bellamy for free. Yeah, that's excellent. Well. Yeah, absolutely. I think you could say now, okay, Suarez that time. I'd say again, going back to Doug Lee's first term round. I'd say this is the first time since that time, the early, like late eighties, early nineties, that Liverpool are paying top dollar for top top uh, players. Do you I, know what I mean? I, I totally agree. What they've done this year from the Van Dyke signing is said we need someone there let's just pay a load of money for one person to mm -hmm. fill the gap mm -hmm. like Van Gaal and Brennan Rodgers here doesn't age brilliantly Van Gaal and Rodgers just like and our Spurs with the bail money yeah. just buy like yeah, yeah. 15 players all of the same not going to yeah. propel you forward yeah. kind of level and that's what Liverpool did with the Suarez oh, money. Listen, like, that's how well, they ended up with um, give us Brendan Rodgers sure. there because he uh, Brendan Rodgers doesn't age great here no 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 yeah. well like his top 10 are uh, Benteke Firmino's worked out well. Lalana's okay. Lovren, Markovic, no. Balotelli, no. Joe Allen was all right. Sacco, no. Klein, not really sure yet. And Sturridge. Sturridge, Sturridge's okay. Sturridge's been okay. To be fair, yeah. on his good value list, he did buy Coutinho for 8.6 million. Yeah, that was, yeah. So that was a snip. That's, that's yeah. your big one. You have those, and, uh, you, you kind of have those, you know, like Xabi Alonso. You know, they've, they've got, they used to pick up lads like that here and there yeah. all the way through it. They're Alonso sprinkled all through. Yeah. That was wow. Benitez. But like, yeah, yeah. that's the thing about Liverpool this time around. I think I think it's the best Liverpool starting eleven they've had in twenty five years. Do you think this could be the year? I'm not going there, Joe. <laughs> I'm not going they're, there. They've, tw they've twenty five points to bridge on City is the problem. I still they think have a, they have a very the handy start game. to the season. They have a very handy start to the season. So they should, if they don't get out of the blocks running, I, as a Liverpool supporter, I'd be worried. But I think it's the best starting eleven they've had in thirty years actually. And I would say, but I would say that the squad. Still, it's probably a maybe game. three players short, four mm. players short. Or just utility guys. Arbaloas, I call them. Yes. Yeah, need yeah, a few yeah. Arbaloas. You do. Some Jimmy Traoris in there. <laughs> Let's say Arbaloas. You win a Champions League <laughs> with Jimmy Traore, you know? Yeah, You're yeah. going places if you yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more than anything, it's just the general mood music around Klopp and Liverpool, which is so appealing. Like, the Man United fans in the room are like, oh my gosh, yeah. we're stuck. And there's music. interesting stuff yeah, about know, the club. Uh, like, uh, Simon Hughes in the London Independent, a piece about just, uh, just about their involvement in the community, because they were. Oof. Bad story for a while around the stadium. Yeah, but that's what I mean. The, the, that's what I'm about to say. Yeah. They were they, they were getting rightly criticised for a lot of the ways mm. uh, they operated, but they have made a big effort to to just reconnect and go yeah. back yeah. to the kind of ideas that Shankly had, like which is very Klopp, difficult in this kind of. You, you put that down to Klopp. I would put down it partly to him. I think yeah. it's. I think it's a lot of things. I think yeah. didn't they get Tony Barrett in there as yeah, a kind yeah, of a fan that, liaison? That was big time. That was yeah. massive. And the they owners. also had a major issue, like about around the fact that they had bought up all the, that area yeah, on Anfield. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the club destroyed that area yeah, deliberately. Yeah. Absolutely. Deliberately destroyed yes. it willfully, yes. and yeah. it was absolutely appalling what they did. And I think they're trying to roll back on that now a little bit. But like the Klopp thing is great and all, but at the, at the risk of sort of channeling, sound like a Kerry football fan, and it's not about vibes anymore. Like. <laughs> You know? <laughs> yeah. Deliver. Yeah. Full what, stop. What would be a deliverance this year? Um that would be a deliverance. Well I mean look at, there's only there's only one thing left to win. Yeah. That's it. And I mean it's not that you're saying they have to win it, but I mean I would be old school that way. Like I mean getting to the Champions League final and all that stuff is great. And even when they won it in Istanbul obviously was wonderful. Uh, well I'm old school, I always prefer to win the league first and then you move forward after mm. that. So for uh, I mean I still think they're far better place to win the Champions League. I think that yeah, they're yeah. suited they're suited yeah. to knockout football. You, you, and uh, I, I don't think they'll win the league. I think City will get there. They'll slip. They might they mightn't quite get quite as many points, but they'll, they'll go very close to it. Like, mm. They haven't invested heavily, but Mandy is like a new signing, and you know they're just they've just picked up Mares. So yeah, and they've been fit in Mares. And, and they, twenty and games this year. Yeah. Yeah. You know they've had another preseason under Guardiola, and they're an awesome team. Do you, do you only think that'll catch them in the Premier League? Now is boredom. 
yeah. you know yeah. and if they just put all their eggs in the Champions League basket as it were but they, you're right they'll probably get caught now in a couple of silly places on the road and sort of get themselves into sp- and there'll be crisis talk and all the rest of it but they're just such, such a good squad and they seem to have a great attitude and the whole environment that he's created around it even though it's probably it always strikes me this kind of you know we're, we're all in it together kind of thing it's a bit fake yeah. in professional football but he seems but to I have think, worked he yeah, seems but to have I think vibes do matter you know? oh they do matter because yeah, even they, like they the, do, the, the mood music from the two Manchester clubs when they were in America like Mourinho was just saying I have nobody yeah. like, look at yeah. the players I have <laughs> yeah. and Guardiola was saying the exact opposite I've loads of young players out here they've been brilliant for me really impressed with their attitude blah blah yeah. blah he yeah. might never play any of them again but at least he's putting out positive vibes saying so that, that stuff that helps that kind of matters yeah. I'd like to see the likes of Phil Foden who they all talk up so much like See what he's like. Give him a run. Yeah. Because why do they invest so much in these academies and never throw anybody, anybody in? Like that's what one of the positives of Liverpool last year that Alexander Arnold was stuck on the team and ended up in a Champions League final. And uh, what's the guy's name? Is it Curtis Jones? Mm. That they were raving about in pre-season. He's only seventeen, but you'd love to see somebody like that get a chance. It's not all about money. Yeah. Big, yeah. Big but then Bed Woodburn's gone out on loan, isn't he? Somewhere yeah. he's, he's gone somewhere. So kind of swings and roundabouts. S- sometimes you do see do see City Champions League matches, and it's not even a full house. And you think if there were some local lads in there who'd come yeah. through, there just might be a bit more. This is ours. Yeah. You know, this actually is still our club as opposed to. Yeah, whatever it is now. Yeah, um, something yeah. I, I can't get my head around is the crowds at pre-season games. Often, like the amount of money people spend to follow the club, like in even England or a, yeah, a, England. Like yeah. and even like uh, I was walking around town before the Arsenal Chelsea game, and there was a load of Arsenal Chelsea fans that come over from London for yeah. it. Like, oh really? It's kind of, yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? The money they must spend all yeah. year round is just incredible. Yeah, um, we'll leave it there unless there's anything else we should point people in the direction of. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. So uh, Mick Foley from the Sunday Times, off to Crow Park now. Thanks a million for coming. Straight there, thanks very much. Kieran on from the Irish Daily Star. Thanks as ever, Kieran. No problem. We'll say goodbye to you on Facebook Live and we'll see you again next week.